lots and lots of pixels. There's over 6,000 in the Android Guide 2017. Hey everybody, welcome to Building Enter Guys. On this episode, we're gonna build the lights and the sound system. Now let's dive into lights. If you're going to light in our car, in our project, or just your desk at home, you're going to provide enough coverage for the entire object. But the more important question is what are you actually using the lights for? So it will vary depending on the size of the area and the purpose for that lighting. Such as providing ambience, outlining the shape of it, or filling the entire thing with LEDs to provide high resolution playback of sequences. Which brings me to diffusion. Do you actually want to see those pixels? If something is more diffused, it's more like ambient light. Versus if you actually want to see the pixel, because then you can actually enable playback of high resolution sources, such as videos. For the first prototype art car, we use polycarbonate plastic sheets, and then we spray a diffuser on them to create that effect. It worked pretty good, except for some minor uniformity issues. It reminded me of like those Christmas windows with the frost on them. So for the new art car, we found these loom channels. They come with these milky plastic covers that just snap inside, and they hold the LEDs in place while also providing some diffusion. They're often used underneath bookshelves and on walls around homes to provide a glowing effect. What I like about using these is the diffusion is strong enough, so when you look at it, it actually doesn't hurt your eyes. You can still make out the pixel, so it supports playback of high resolution sequences. LED strips can be purchased with different IP ratings. They provide different kinds of water and dust protection. So this one here has no waterproof protection. You can just see the printed circuit board. You can see here, this is IP65. There's a silicone coating on top of the LED strip, providing protection from water, dust, and also adds a little bit of rigidity to it. Whereas IP67 means you can get a whole plastic sleeve that the LED strip is gonna slip into and that provides the most water protection. And there's IP68, which is a combination of both the silicone coating and the plastic sleeve. The more IP protection that you require increases the cost of the LED strip. For Burning Man, it really depends on if your diffuser is gonna protect it from the sand. We're gonna be using those aluminum channels with the Milky White covers, so they're pretty much sealed and safe. I recommend the IP65 silicone coating protection because they can often fit inside diffusion channels and are easily cleanable. Also, they're a bit more rugged. The silicone coating holds them together versus just the soldering joints that were connected in the factory. So what are the differences between all of these LEDs? There's the WS2011, WS2011 12B, and then one's higher than that as well. You'll probably want a WS2012 B LED strip. These are five volts and are individually adjustable pixels. Versus the WS2011 LED strips. These are 12 volts and addressable every three LED pixels. This means if you send a light sequence, it's going to show you the same color in three pixels instead of one at that moment. Then there's versions above this. There's a WS2013B. That has an extra data line in it, so if one pixel fails, the rest of the LED strip still continues to work. This kind of reminds me of those old Christmas lights, where if one light bulb fails, the whole strip would stop working. So where to buy LED strips? I highly recommend checking the prices on Alibaba and Amazon. Make sure you're looking at the right specs though. The waterproofing, the density, so 30, 60, or 144 pixels per meter, and that they're 5 volts. So what's a light budget? It's not just a budget that's light. A light budget refers to the amount of power you're gonna need to handle all those lights. There's no one size fits all approach here. It really depends what you're gonna be playing back on the pixels and then how bright you're gonna have them set to. If you play a lot of light sequences where there's movement and your pixels go on and off, then you can budget for less because not all your pixels are gonna be on at the same time. Remember that an LED pixel actually contains three pixels, a red, a green, and a blue. So if you're only be using red or green, then you'll only be turning on that one pixel of the three for that LED. So you'll only be using one third of the power. Once you start requesting other colors, then that LED has to turn on all three RGB pixels, and that uses more power. And that's why white uses so much power. It requires a red, green, and blue beyond a full. And that's why I recommend not using white sequences in any of your stuff. So it's important to know if you're gonna use white sequences, you need to budget for all three of those pixels inside an LED to be on. Also, brightness has a huge impact on power consumption. And that's why with this art car, with 6,000 pixels, we're gonna only run them at 20% brightness. That's gonna save us some power and also save people their eyes because the brightness is gonna be crazy. With that many pixels and that brightness, playing a blue or green sequence, we're using less than 200 watts of power. So a good number to use when figuring out your light budget is 0.1 watts per pixel. So 6,000 pixels, that's 600 watts. And you can adjust the brightness down from there to come up to about 200 watts. So that gives you the room to grow, to drop the brightness, or play different kinds of sequences to lower the power requirements. So for this art car with a 600 watt light budget, that means a low voltage power system has to be able to handle 45 amps at 12 to 14 volts. If you want more information on the battery pack design to handle those requirements, go check out the battery and board floor episodes. So how do we power the LEDs? For this art car, we bought a bunch of down converters, also known as buck converters. So for example, these take a range of power from nine to 40 volts DC, provided from the low voltage battery pack, depending on the state of charge, and then drop that down into a fixed five volts that is used by the lights. 
What's great about using these is the battery's voltage is going to change depending on the state of charge. But the lights are going to always be given a fixed 5 volts, so the brightness will never change. One thing to note about long runs of LEDs is voltage drop. You'll need to inject power every 3 meters, which is about 10 feet. What this does is it prevents the colors from going yellow because of low voltage. One question that I get asked often is how you control LEDs, and everybody's doing something different. It's really going to depend on what your budget is, where you're going to play on them, and how big of a light setup you have. For the 2015 prototype bar car, we use a Raspberry Pi to play back the light sequences, and I highly recommend not to use that. The Raspberry Pi's ability and compatibility to play back light sequences is actually pretty limiting. So for this year's art car, we're going to use a Teen Arduino, which is a pretty popular controller for LED strips. The board itself is pretty small in form factor and has a lot of pins that you can use to connect to different LED strips. However, things can get complicated pretty quickly. If you require higher frame rates, or you have zigzag wiring requiring offsets where your LEDs will go one way and then reverse back in the other way, then you might not actually want to use an Arduino. Ultimately, if you have a pretty crazy setup, a dedicated DMX or ArtNet compatible pixel controller is best. And we're looking into that in a future episode. Now it's time to install those LED channels. The aluminum channels, which will hold the LEDs, were installed into all the panels around the car and bolted in. And we had some help from some amazing friends. Now it's time to wire in those teensy Arduinos which we're using for light controllers. The warp floor finally got wired to the light controllers, and it looked amazing. It took a little bit of time to get all the light control scripts configured with the offset and zigzag configurations. Then each of the saucer panels was wired with 600 LED pixels. And then once the roof is on, it's going to have over 6,000 pixels all around. Each LED strip was wired to a power connector that went to the step-downs and a data line that went to the light controller. Each row had a zigzag configuration. That means it had a loopback in the front of the vehicle, going back to the back, and then power was injected once again. The light panels look pretty stunning once they are complete, and we had light control scripts for red, green, and blue sequences. I put together a lower saucer made of acrylic sheets. I built little angle connectors and bolted them together to the bottom of the car. There were a few goals in mind with this design. First, I wanted the saucer and the seats to appear floating. And second, I wanted the lower saucer to illuminate the ground. By just placing some LEDs underneath the seats, the lower saucer panel illuminated the ground really well. For the sound system, I bought model price in-wall speakers. They produce pretty good sound for the price and can be easily hidden inside the R-Car. They work best when placed inside sealed containers. In the first R-Car, they are placed in the cells, which were made of two round containers zip tied together. This provided some pretty impressive bass with deep sound for these small speakers. For this year's R car, we've got some rectangular containers, which will be used as speaker boxes underneath the floating seats and on the outsides of the vehicle. Once again, a Dremel was used to create the hole in the container for that speaker. I bought a JBL Marine amplifier. It was pretty well sealed and will keep the dust out. Now it's time for test drive in the Interguise 2017. And it was working pretty well. And that's good because we're only two weeks until Burning Man. And those light panels in blue, which has 20% brightness, looked amazing. On the next episode of Building Enter Guys, we're going to build a solar roof, computer systems, and talk about charging. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, hit the subscribe and notification buttons to be alerted for new episodes each Thursday.